Hey everybody, how you doing? Pastor Mark here for Midday with Mark. How you doing? Glad you're here. Uh, if you're watching this live or watching it later, coming at you live for the final episode of Midday with Mark, episode 45, coming at you live from Pandemic Pennsylvania, Pandemic Pittsburgh, Corona Coriopolis. Uh, thanks for joining me. Glad you're here for this final, final episode, and that is episode number 45. Yeah, episode number 45. Wow, that's crazy, huh? My hair's gotten longer. I've probably gotten fatter, um, like everybody has in quarantine, uh, unless you've been working out like a beast. How many of you have been working out like a beast? Anybody been working out like a beast? Like, you've been getting after it, maybe hitting it hard. Well, glad you're here. Here we go. Last day, Friday, woohoo! We're out of lockdown in Pittsburgh, and we are in the yellow. We went from red to yellow, and then hopefully green. So glad you're here. Welcome, 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 welcome for our final, final edition of Midday with Mark. A couple announcements. Midday with Mark is, is going to be coming midweek with Mark. So every Wednesday, I'm going to come on and uh, do a little devotional, probably around noon. Uh, so love to have you join me for midweek with Mark. That'll be every Wednesday. And then on Fridays, we're going to do an update for our church. Uh, and uh, I'll just be kind of a, a short update of things going on in our church. So love to have you join in for that, too. So midday with Mark's going away, but midweek with Mark will be here starting Wednesday. Um, second announcement is, now that we're out of lockdown, my church is going to, uh, we're going to still have an online service, but we are starting a parking lot drive-in service at our church starting May 24th. So not this Sunday, but next Sunday, May 24th, parking lot service, 11 o'clock. You can come sit in your car or you can bring your lawn chair sitting right outside your car, right in front of your car. Live music, live message. You can listen on your FM radio in your car if you want. Uh, it's just going to be a great time to kind of be together, but not be together, but you got to be socially distant and you got to obey the rules of that. So, um, love to have you come check us out, share this with someone. There's ads on Facebook. Love to have you come and, and check out our midday with, or not midday, our, our drive-in service happening on Sunday. So, uh, I thought a little bit about it. It's hard to believe I've been, I was doing some reflecting on 45 days um, you know, there's a lot of lessons to learn from the last few week, months. Um, I hope you've learned to slow down. I hope you've learned to take time to be in God's word. Uh, if you've done been doing this, we've been doing that together. I hope you've had time with each other. I hope you've had to, time to reevaluate uh, your life, re kind of reevaluate your priorities and kind of what you're doing. And uh, I hope that's been something you've been able to do during this uh, quarantine. Uh, I started out doing this every week and then I stopped, but I thought it'd be appropriate to end with this. I'm going to give you a little, a little pick me up, a little Christmas cheer. Are you ready? We all need a little Christmas cheer right about now. So one last time, here we go. You ready? In my house. Hallelujah. Check it out. The Christmas tree is still up in May. Look at that. Oh, one last peek. One last peek. There you go. Soak it in. Take a deep breath. I hope you love it. Um, it's usually taken down at the end of winter. I usually leave it up uh, through winter, but all this hit right about then, and I just thought I'd leave it up. I like the lights in my house. So there it is. One last time, you get one last look at the Christmas tree. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Hey, um, I thought about what I want to talk about today. So no books today, no pops today, none like that. I thought we'd just end together. And so... I thought about what I would like to talk about. Like, what was I going to talk about? Like, I finished up a series on Nehemiah, finished up a series where we were looking at this book right here called The Myth of the American Dream. Finished that up. You should read this book, though. Go get it. Um, I think you'd enjoy it. So I thought about what am I going to talk about today? What what do I have to share today on this last midday with Mark? And here's what I came up with. And uh, I thought I would just simply today... Uh, share with you my testimony and uh, what uh, what verse uh, really meant something to me right when I became a Christian 
still does to this day. If it's probably a theme verse of my life, theme verses in a lot of ways. Uh, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I was, oh, hi, Mike. How is that dang tree still there? It's still here, Mike. You can come over if you want it. Come over and check it out. I know you, I know you'd want to. So, um, so, uh, you can come over now. You're allowed. So that's where I, we're in the yellow. Um, we can have groups of 25 or less. So, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my story. If you don't know me, if you're watching this, you don't know me very well. Um, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit. Hey, Chris Pfeiffer, what's up? No season two. No, no season two. I hope not. I hope no season two. I hope not. So uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my story to wrap everything up here, these 45 days or 42 days of doing uh, Midday with Mark. I was just watching my friend Aaron Kleiber. He does this daily dad thing. And I was just watching him. He was on day 45 and he's going to go to 50. But I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to end at 42. Good number. Jackie Robinson, good number, 42. I never thought I'd do 42 of these. So um, so a little bit about me. I uh, Just a little bit about my story. I, I grew up at, uh, in a Christian home. I grew up uh, going to the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. That's what I grew up in. Um, and I would not describe myself as, uh, now that I know, as a follower of Jesus, I would say I was a, I was a, I was a church kid. I went to church my whole life. My, my parents took me to church, and and uh, it was incredibly boring to me. And we had these really nasty orange pews at my church. I grew up at Conway CMA, Conway Christian Missionary Alliance, and uh, and I was just kind of trugging through life. And um, I was kind of a normal teenager, and. Um, I was not a bad kid. I was a pretty good kid. I never, like I say to people, I never smoked, drank, or chewed, or went with girls that do. Um, so that was kind of my thing, and I, I was just kind of a good kid. I think I was more afraid of doing bad things than I was. It didn't have a religious part to it, for sure. And then um, I used to go to this camp called Suncrest Camp, uh, where there's a lot of people that watch this who actually know me, go to, have grew up at that same camp. A lot of pastors, it's really crazy. There's a ton of pastors around this area who are pretty prominent pastors or have been prominent pastors, whatever that means, uh, in Pittsburgh, who all came from uh, that camp, all came from Suncrest Camp. It's amazing how Jesus met people there. But when I went to Suncrest Camp, I basically went there to hang out with friends and uh, maybe to meet some girls that were girl counselors too. Uh, and to hang out. And I actually dated a girl for a long time that I met at camp. And so camp was just like a lot of fun for me. And I kind of tolerated the Jesus stuff and I wasn't real serious about it. Didn't really give it a second thought. And then, um, this one year when I was, uh, when I was a sophomore and, and, uh, when I was a soft, I met this guy when I was, uh, I can't remember. I think I was going into my freshman year at Geneva yeah, I was going into my freshman year, the summer before my freshman year, I met this guy named Dave Grove. And Dave Grove became a friend of mine. And um, Dave was, we hit it off. I mean, we were just buds. And um, But he was very different than me in, in that he was really serious about his faith. He was really serious about Jesus. He was really serious about my, his faith. I didn't have a clue what that was. I really just... I was a broadcasting major at Geneva College. I wanted to go into broadcasting. Uh, I loved, I loved, I was doing radio and some TV and and different things. And I, I just had no, there was no real love for God in my life. I would not say that there ever was back then a love for God. And then I, and then I, um, and then uh, I, I met Dave Grove, and you know he was this very serious Christian. He was a musician, wrote Christian music, just very very serious about his faith. And, uh, uh, I, uh, I went off to college. Dave didn't either have enough money to go to college or whatever. And so Dave was just kind of working a normal job, just kind of, I think he worked at a gas station, saving up money, trying to figure out what he was, uh, you know, going to do with his life. And, um, I, uh, I went to Geneva and through that course, we had a mutual friend, um, that I dated for a little bit, but, we had a mutual friend that also went to Geneva and I kind of lost touch with Dave. Uh, a whole, not all, I, I didn't see him a whole lot. I think I saw him maybe in the summer, maybe once or twice, but kind of like there's some pictures online from my Facebook of me and him hanging out. And 
Uh, so somewhere around March, right around March of 1989, um, I get a phone call and, um, it is our mutual friend, um, who says she'd been looking for me all day. I actually had went home for a little bit. Uh, and I was actually hanging out at home and, uh, I get the phone call, uh, from her and she says, uh, we've been looking for you all day. Everybody's been trying to get a hold of you. This is before you know, cell phones and all that stuff. And she says, um, she's like, Dave was killed in a car accident last night. And I was like, what? And she goes on to tell me the story about how he was coming home late from hanging out with his girlfriend. And he'd fallen asleep, uh, driving, which I actually did too. When I was a senior in high school, I fell asleep driving and um, could have easily killed myself. Um, it was a miracle that I didn't kill both my brother and I. That's kind of an amazing uh, God story there. Hi, Janie. Um, so, so it was, uh, so, so I found out that Dave had passed away and, and I was 19 years old. So I was 19 years old. He was 19. Found out he had died. Um, it just wrecked me. I, I actually, at that point, as a 19 year old, I actually didn't I don't think I knew anybody who had died. Um, so I had never experienced, I don't think I'd ever been to a funeral. I, it's just the way my life worked out. And so I was kind of a wreck. I was kind of a mess. And, um, and um, I went to the viewing. So I don't think I'd ever been to a viewing before. And so at 19, I, I, I went to this viewing and I was incredibly emotional, incredibly upset. And, um, and Dave's mom kind of pulled me aside and she said, Hey, I want to talk to you. And, you know, she could tell I wasn't doing very well. And she goes, I want, I want you to, do you know the story about how David died? And I was like, well, I know he was in a car wreck. I know. And so she goes, let me tell you the story. And she told me this story about how David was coming home from, from his girlfriends. He'd fallen asleep. He wrecked into like a pole. Uh, the, the car was so badly mangled that like they couldn't get him out. They had to use the jaws of life and he was pretty hurt, pretty bad. And, um, they, uh, took him to the hospital. He had had some chest injuries and he was in a lot of pain. He was by himself. They couldn't find his wallet. So back then like things took longer, couldn't find his wallet. They didn't know who he was immediately. So they didn't know who to get a hold of. And, uh, he, um, he was really having a hard time, like breathing, having a hard time, literally staying alive. And he was asking for his mother and, uh, he was, you know, he was just kind of delirious with pain and they were trying to rush him, I guess, to get him into surgery and, and, uh, cause he needed surgery to save his life. And, um, obviously he didn't make it, but his mom said that the nurse told her that he kept asking for his mom you know, he kept asking for his parents. Um, but then, but then she said that he said, he kept saying three words over and over and over again. And those three words that he kept saying over and over again were, was, I know Jesus, I know Jesus, I know Jesus. And, uh, that just kind of wrecked me. Um, I knew, I knew that I didn't have that kind of faith. I knew that if my life was ending, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't say those words. I, I didn't know Jesus. I didn't, I couldn't say that I knew him. Um, and so I kind of fumbled my way through the next few months, like March, April, May. And then June, I went back to this camp where I met Dave. Um, and I was there as a counselor for a little kids camp. And again, I was there mostly to hang out with my friends and, um, and, you know, hang out with the girl counselors and, but something was happening inside of me. And this one night, this guy named John Myers got up to speak to our little kids and he did a puppet show. I know puppets, right? Puppet show. He did a puppet show. And then after that puppet show he did for these little kids, this is 1989, he shared the gospel message with, uh, these kids, but it was like, I was hearing it for the first time. Now I grew up in the church. 
I had heard the gospel message a million times, but it was like Jesus was speaking right to me. It was like the Holy Spirit turned the lights on in my heart and in my mind where I could respond to the gospel. And, and it was breaking me. I mean, it was literally, I, so I got up, I was, I was there as a counselor. He shares the gospel and then he gives an altar call. I don't know if you grew up in a church where there were altar calls where you could go forward to the altar and, and accept Jesus. And I got up, this is for these little kids, but I got up as their counselor and I went forward and just kind of poured out my heart to Jesus. And I said, I want to know you. I want to know you and I'll do whatever you want me to do. I just want to know you. And it was like, I, it's so hard to explain to somebody who's never had that kind of experience, but it was like, it was like God was right there. And it was as if, I mean, I just knew, I just fell in love with him at that moment. I just fell in love with him and I knew that he loved me. And I know that sounds like you hear people say that a lot. You hear me say that a lot. But I knew in that moment that he loved me. And I knew that I loved him. And I literally fell in love. That's the best way that people have asked me over the 30 years of ministry. Like, what, what happened that you became a minister or whatever? And I say, I literally just fell in love with Jesus. It was not my plan. It was not what I wanted to do. I had to go back to school and I felt called like over those next two weeks, I fell in love with Jesus and I felt called to ministry, specifically ministry with teenagers. And I would end up doing that for 20 years. And God called me to the ministry and he called me. Um, I mean, I had to change everything. I, I, I um, changed my major. I added a major, actually youth ministry. I mean, my whole trajectory of my life in 1989, in the summer of 1989, completely changed. Uh, that's now been almost 31 years ago, or 30, whatever it is. And so that's uh, the best thing that ever happened to me. I, you know, I feel like I'm a guy who just found where the really good stuff is. And I've just been spending the last 30 years trying to tell people how to get that. And that's it. That's as simple as ministry is to me. I... I don't like getting in large theological debates with people. Obviously, I love to learn and I love to grow and and I love, but all of it's more just to know Jesus better and how to share Jesus with people better. That's I just want to know Him. That's kind of been the cry of my life. And um, maybe on my tombstone when I die, the words that I'll have put on my tombstone are, "Is I know Jesus, I know Jesus." Um, that's kind of my story. Uh, that's how I came to know Christ. Um, that's how I became a Christian. That's how I, that's how I became a minister. Uh, again, nothing I planned to ever do. Maybe you've heard that for the first time just now. You've never heard that before, but that's kind of my story. Maybe you've heard it before. I, I love telling it. It's a story that still means so much to me, uh, as a 50 year old, soon to be 51 year old in a couple months. But, uh, I thought I'd share with you a verse that uh, well, there was the Philippians verse that became really um, special to me, like in Philippians chapter three, where Paul says, I want to know Jesus. Uh, obviously, that really resonated with me because of my story. I want to I want to know Jesus and be found in him. I love that verse. It's still one of my favorite verses in the entire scripture is to know him uh, and to be found in him. Uh, I have found my life in him. And it's been an amazing life. It's had a lot of pain, uh, especially in the last eight years. There was a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. But I found myself in him. I found my life in him. And I know him. Um, I've let him down a million times. Um, but I know him. And uh, that's real. And that's the most realest thing I ever, I ever experienced. Mark chapter 8. Um, Mark writes this in Mark chapter 8. Sorry. Um, this story always makes me a little emotional. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. This is what it says Jesus about Jesus. says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. And he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And this is what I've found to be true is whenever you lose your life in Jesus, you literally find it. And then he says, what good is it if for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. That verse is one of the first verses that was highlighted in the first Bible I ever bought for myself. I don't know, the old student Bibles. I don't know if you guys remember that. An old NIV student Bible. The NIV wasn't that old, actually, when I bought it. But they had these old student, they had these student Bibles, and I bought one with my own money, and that was a big deal to me. And this was one of the first verses I highlighted all the way through that Bible. And this is one of those first verses that meant so much to me that to find my life in Jesus, to lose my life for the gospel, that I will find it. That I want to know Jesus and I want to be found in him. That's still the cry of my heart 30 years, 30 some years later. Um, I want to try to keep it that simple. And when it doesn't get that simple, then that's when I get really kind of off track. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I hope you enjoyed it uh, here on the final midday with Mark. Uh, sorry, I'm a little late today, but we were recording worship for church on Sunday. But I hope you enjoyed that. Um, hope you enjoyed my story. Thanks for being here for as many of the 42 days that you've been with me. Uh, go back and watch the old ones if you want. I think you might get something out of it. But remember that as a Christian, you can be found in Jesus. You can know Jesus. And all you have to do then is tell people, I always say this, there's an old person, old writer that said this, I'm just a beggar who found the bread and now I try to find, tell other beggars how to find the bread. That's really how I view it. That's really all I've done. I've found the good stuff and I want others to know him because there is life and there is eternal life in him. So thank you for listening. Thank you for listening these last 42 days. It's been my honor, my privilege uh, to talk to you and and uh, hopefully poured a little bit into your life. And I hope I helped you find Jesus and know him a little deeper. So have a great day. I'll see you on on uh, I'll see you on the uh, service uh, on our service on YouTube or Facebook this week at um, eight, nine thirty, and eleven. And then I'd love to see you out in our parking lot at the River Franklin Park next Sunday. Mission Mahi will be there. It's going to be a great day, 11 o'clock in the parking lot. Come early, get a spot. Love to see you. Take care. Have a great day. Enjoy the, enjoy the warm weather. Bye-bye. Somehow, maybe goodbye. I'm trying.